Today, I'm on my way to meet Karima Hassan, the artist who accumulates her designs from the studio to the streets. Recognised for her community showcase teasers exhibiting artwork alongside circles of creatives, Hassan takes pride in connecting the atmosphere of her work with the audience. With Bangladeshi and Yemeni heritage, the Welsh-born artist expresses one-of-a-kind captivating and bold enhancements to her paintings. Working with iconic clients like The Highland New York, Ted Baker, The Barbican and many more, Hassan has an increasing clientele often sought out by major companies. As I sit down with Hassan, I'll be covering topics including where she takes her inspiration from, what impact she would like to make on society and who Karima Hassan really is. Hey. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us today. I think what you've been doing is extremely impressive. And I felt like having this conversation, which it is, it's not, there's no right or wrong mm. answer, will really enlighten people to understanding a bit more about your perspective, your experience, and just who Karima is. So thank you first and foremost for giving us no. the space to do so. You're welcome. So Newport Wells. How did that mould and shape Karima? Okay, so you've, <laughs> you've done the research. Um, yeah, so Newport Wales, that is where I grew up, born and raised. Um, for like anyone listening who doesn't know, Newport is like a working class, or even you, it's a working class, like port town in South Wales. Um, quite monocultured quite a lot of poverty and like a real like resilience and grit and humor and like salt of the earth kind of vibe to the people um i was raised with my mum who was kind of like a single mum with the family big family and um we kind of just got on with life and we just my mum was you know visibly muslim we're in a hijab and quite like a white city in a white town so we always stood out so we'd kind of would just work hard and just keep our head down and just try and be kind to people and that was my foundation really wow so your mum was from bangladesh right? yeah so mum's from bangladesh born and raised in london and then dad is from yemen and wales um he grew up in cardiff which is like the next city um yeah so that was where i was what was that relationship like with dad and mum was it just raised by mum or was yeah it pretty much just raised by my mum my dad was there in the background and then he yeah he was he was a part um but mainly my mum is like yeah the, the, the spine and you, you mentioned like growing up in wells which is a predominantly white uh, mm. area per se um and you being from a muslim descent and having, like you said, your mum in the hijab, how did that kind of shape your identity at the, at the early stages? How were you interpreting that environment and how it reacted to you or your family? Yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, when you're a kid, you are you know that something's off, but you don't know why. And you kind of just learn to be, It's those things that have moulded me have become my incredible strengths now. So being totally empathetic came from me trying to understand people's energies and emotions and why they were acting in certain ways. Um, and how I could be safe was to understand and be very attuned to people's reactions. Um, having that kind of experience in prejudice and experiencing being the bridge in between worlds, again, is my like strength now. But growing up, it was always frustrating to be on the outside and to not truly belong in any specific pocket. Um, like it definitely f has shaped. I always think that like life was never the same after 9-11. And so like growing up on the cusp of just within a week, going from being accepted and loved to being a monster and seeing how the world can just shift views that quickly again has been a blessing because I'm super skeptical and observant of the narrative now because I saw how that was flipped upon my family and what we identified with so quickly 
and this conflict of grief and things that it's just really in a really layered way it's like it's made my whole outlook on life really like layered and there's always two sides to the story and I think that's really helped me but like if I because I come to London now and I'm and like I've got friends who they're Muslim and they're the majority and they grew up in the majority and they don't know what it's like to be in a minority so it works both ways and I think having experience being the minority it just makes you so empathetic like it makes you really wish for never one like sorry for like for no one to ever feel like that like yeah. you never want anyone to feel like they don't belong it's just it's crap looking back how do you think you navigated it so like doing the reflection work because you know that i like to like yeah. <laughs> like to go in and reflect i think i navigated it through coping mechanisms like disassociation so these aren't healthy but i disassociated from my body i disassociated from my identity i became introverted and shy i would just I went to drawing I went to painting I went to art I went to the things that I could have like find dream worlds in um because I didn't know how to verbalize that like I didn't have the language and I didn't have the the things to verbalize that yeah and now did you ever experience like that kind of feeling of Indifferent? disassociation I guess or like or, or coping from that some levels, yeah, I can identify what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like looking at the trajectory of like the Muslim community, for example, and their view of arts, how are you able to, at that stage, kind of mm. explore that as a, as a, as a solution for mm, that so association? Yeah, that's like a really layered response because I've got like the first childhood responses my mum was amazing she was always the person that she's a primary school teacher so she'd be like here's glitter here's glue go make something like have fun play and that was great but like art was you know I would be there for hours like in school like I would spend more time on the dinner table doing my art GCSE than anything else combined but then it was always coming from a brown community it was the hobby it was never the career it was never the path so the trick was like with with that like Muslim upbringing. It was also because in Islam, certain forms of art are frowned upon, and you're not allowed to practice. That it was kind of like these like restrictions and this box that was put on this expression. So it was always this kind of like hobby thing. Um, and then I went into architecture and I went into different disciplines of art because I didn't know that art was something I could pursue. It just wasn't on the table, and so then kind of refinding my voice teaching myself how to be an artist how what that even means and then how to incorporate islam and my practice into that into that world has been like a real dance because it's not just like the thing you do it's like the lifestyle behind it too it's like the yeah it's it's like the networking. How do I like practice my faith and do the networking side? And how do I, like the business side of it, how do I like conduct faith and then like manage money in a way that has integrity? And how do I like all of these things? Like I'm learning from myself and from others, but yeah. So you, so you, from what it sounds like initially, you was like, you knew that art was a direction you, or a passion you had, but you kind of commercialized it into architecture and something that was more communicating, something you could communicate yeah. back to, to family or... Okay, so here's the thing. I knew it was a huge passion. I thought that was normal. I thought everyone had that massive passion, mm -hmm. that like burning fire in their belly. For one, I thought that was normal. And I just didn't... I wanted to make... I wanted to like... I'm so like kind of curious about science and maths and philosophy and these things. I wanted to incorporate that into my life. And that's why I studied architecture. I was like, how can we make cities better? How can like I be a force for good in that sense? So that's why I went into like architecture. Um, and then when I did it, I realized all the things I want to do, like the revolutionary things you can't do with all this red tape around you and 
actually, I maybe can get away with more if I go at it from an artist perspective. And it was more just like a code switch of hats. And, um, but for me, like breaking through the like, the family's apprehensions of, oh, how do you do that? No one in our family's done that. Like no one in our community's done that. No one in like, and no one in, like, it's, it's hard to find female Muslim artists. And so it was really hard to try and find like the confidence. And so that's why I like, I, I make it such a habit now to try and like go through the process and the work of building up my own confidence to be able to like even become safe in this arena. I mean, at this point, you've clearly broke some boundaries and accumulated some success around your work. At that time, what were you? Where were you drawing that confidence from when, when, when none of this was around? When there was no studio, when there was no mm-hmm. following, what where were you drawing from? Basically, this huge, like this gut knowing that this is my calling, and like this gut knowing that my voice matters, which it was it's hard to say when society and your family maybe don't teach you to think your voice matters. It's even harder to, to, to own that and for me to say that like to you now. But yeah, it, it was this knowing, this like kind of like fire, like that didn't make sense. Like as an outside, you know, it was like a small, sweet, kind brown girl that did all the right things. But I had this like huge revolutionary, like a kinship to, to civil rights figures and to like, to, to politicians and to poets and to philosophers that felt true. And now I'm like starting to realize like, oh, that's just the inner me that always wanted to come out that is coming out. And I just, I think just having that faith that, yeah, like it's inside me. Did you ever try to suppress it? Did you try to ignore it at any other stage? Um, yeah. And that's what, yeah. <laughs> so basically like in 2018, I, um, I kind of just got really ill. Like I'm, I, so the reason I know I dissociate from my body is because I would, before when I was a kid and even now, sometimes I'd get like eczema, psoriasis, like bloating, like like my body was the thing, is the thing that tells me that, that, that like there's something that's been suppressed. I remember in like life kind of was just like piling on different things in a way that like a relationship went or a job went. And if it was just one thing that went, you would kind of be okay. But it was like, when it all goes then you have to like stand still. And I had that. And I remember like, you know how JK Rowland talks, like when you hit a bottom, like it's great. Cause you know, you can only go up and that kind of happened. And, and I realized I'd suppressed so much and my body was like caving in because also I had suppressed all those urges and those desires and those needs. And even though I was waking up at like 3 a.m. and I was drawing like, and this didn't make sense when I was just like working in advertising at the time and stuff. And I was like slowly bridging into freelance and slowly doing the art. And as I was waking up to like, I could have this feeling of expansion, then the feeling of contraction and being that job or the feeling of contraction and being in that environment was even worse because I knew what I was missing out on. And then when I knew that, it felt like I was suppressing and, and um, yeah, like it, it was almost like a, a bit of a midlife crisis, but not midlife, just a bit of a, like a, a bit of a crisis point. And now I know it was meant to be that way. Like I, I learned. And you reacted to that by stepping more into it? Was, was it? Yeah. So I think I only got that suppression because I had already started stepping into it slightly. Like I think, the like, when you read like help things or personal development and stuff and people like follow your passion, go all in. I think that's a bit of a lie. Like I think the best thing to do is actually find bridges that help you to step into it and to test the water and see what it's like. And um, that's kind of what I, I was doing for about six months to a year was I was like working in one job and then doing other jobs. And like, and I was seeing that as I was getting some illustration work or graphic design work, I needed to be in the art world, but I didn't, I was never around artists before. Like I didn't go to art school. I didn't have artist friends. I didn't have an artist family. So I didn't know what that would be like, but I just knew I just needed to try and follow it. Yeah. 
So you, you, you leave Wales uh, at some point? Yeah, so I left Wales, yeah. You come to study? Is it to study? To London. Yeah, London to study. Yeah, and around about that transition. What, what was that? I mean, leaving Wales is what you know, family. Yeah, but I'd always wanted to, I always wanted to escape. I always wanted to escape. And then I, st- I stayed in Wales because they had like one of the best architecture programs. So I did my bachelor's there. Then I moved to Prague, actually. Uh, yeah, and well, before that, sorry, I moved to Zurich. I worked in Zurich for a bit. I wanted to get away. I wanted to be in a place where there's great design. And then after I did some work in Zurich, then I came to London to do my master's. And then after that, then I worked around in different places. I went to Japan, Prague and New York and stuff. But yeah, that transition, I mean, it was actually quite easy for me because my family, a lot of my family are from London. And so I always felt like like I belonged here anyway. Like I always felt like London was a reflection of me more than Wales was. Mm And I was very used to like being super independent and living my own way. So actually it was pretty okay. I think that um, something I've spoken to with friends is like London can be really lonely, I find. Like in a lot of my work, when I first started painting, it was specifically to like target that. And it was about finding communities in London where I could say, hey, I find this amazing open mic, you should go to it. Or, hey, I find this amazing like poetry club, you should go to it. And it was because, um, I, yeah, I just spotted that people are, can be really lonely in London, which makes no sense because like it's a city. But this feeling of you have to have it all together and you have to be solid and you have to like blaze this path can be often like at the detriment of saying, I need help, I need people, I need support. I need to put myself out there and find people. And I think if you don't grow up in London, like if you grow up in London, you you, you have your friends and your family there that you grew up with. But if you don't grow up in that city, it can be quite like even more alienating. And so um, even now, like the Strangers Yoga Project and like other projects that I'm doing, it's always about like, connecting to people and just using painting as a bridge to connect because like that's all it is really and you've gone around so prague switzerland yeah. london how has your identity connected um mm. throughout this oh yeah that's um <laughs> i mean like it's ongoing right like we're always evolving mm. i'm always going to be a work in progress but the identity part is becoming like more solid and anchored in who I am as a person. Like living in different cities, it's funny because because I was used to um, living in Wales where I was the outsider. I find it really easy to live in like other places where I was the outsider, like Zurich or Prague or Japan, but they are very monoculture societies too. And I realized I don't want to put myself in that if I don't need to. I don't want to put myself in a situation where I am the minority, like, or I don't feel like I belong. Like I have the choice to choose where I can go. And that's why I chose New York or Toronto or London where I felt a reflect, like ref- my values are reflected onto me. Um, it kind of solid- solidified my identity. Um, like for example, when I was in Zurich, I was, you know, straight out of uni. Um, and I just remember like my first day in work, like I didn't know that the office, they spoke German, they hired me, they didn't tell me. So I arrived in this new city, never lived outside of Cardiff before, lived on my own, first day of work, didn't speak the language, new programs, dropped into this like different environment and just kind of just taught myself the language, taught myself the programs, taught myself the city, just taught myself. I'm just, I remember like just thinking, this is just part of life, right? Because it's just part of the game of life of just adventure. And I think it's just helped shape my identity of just knowing that really, truly, just all humans are the same. Like I've met a lot of people and we're just, we all have the same wants and needs and like desires, really. I think it's really interesting to kind of like explore like the concepts of you actually being quite introverted mm. and, and kind of holding your creativity inside mm. but then transitioning to publicly displaying your work which I'm assuming is 
vulnerable to you because yes, it's, it's yeah. an expression of what's inside. How how is that navigating that going from being someone that keeps it into someone that puts literally their heart? Oh, <laughs> excruciating, <laughs> like so painful, but so necessary. Yeah. Like Neil Gaiman, he has this amazing line in one of his great speeches where he says, "Like the moment you feel like you're walking down the street naked is the moment you're getting it right with with." with revealing your craft and the moments where I feel like oh no this is too tender like this story is too tender this writing is too tender this thing is too tender I remember like this is just me unraveling like this needs to be shared but to step back a bit the thing it was it was I was petrified to share my stuff originally and because for me when I was a kid, that's how I would try to translate how I was feeling because I couldn't verbalize the complexity and the layers of what I understood. I would try and draw. And now I think like, wow, I wish I had someone who understood that's what was going on. And so I knew that that was my coping mechanism, but I couldn't even verbalize these things. So let alone to tell someone this is what this meant, I couldn't do it for a long, long time. And it was only um, recently, probably in the past five years. And I remember just like, it doesn't happen in one fell swoop, this like, let's be vulnerable and let's declare my soul into you. Like, it was more like, I'm just gonna show this little like sketch I made when I was on holiday on Instagram. And I remember being so scared about that. And that was just five years ago, petrified. And people being like, I don't know you sketch. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, like I sketch every single day. You just don't understand. Like I sketch and like when I'm crying, like when I'm happy, when I'm this, when I'm that, like it's my, it's my best friend. But I remember people like people thinking that were closest to me, like, I don't know you do that. And I think it gets its flack, but like social media is great in that way because I remember it gives people a chance to bear that part in a, in a safe way controlled way of like I have this other side to me and it was really vulnerable at first and I remember remember being really scared because I was thinking people don't know this side to me I shouldn't show this and I'm even in uni like they didn't quite know that I was that that emotional or that and can like connected to art and it's been a real process but now I'm really like happy that I've built the confidence and the skill set to tap into emotions that serves others and serves myself. And what I mean with that is like now I'm starting to get to a place where I can observe emotions and they serve me and I'm not attached to them. So I can I can tell you anything about any feeling mm-hmm. and I don't really care like what you think or what I think because I know it's just emotions and I know that they'll pass and I know they're not me and that it doesn't like, I don't feel so attached to that as my identity. And that helps me to be vulnerable. Whereas just three years ago, if I saw, if someone saw me crying, I would be so petrified because I thought that means that therefore I am weak and they'll think I'm weak and I can't show that. Or like, I can't say I love you first because that means I'm weak. And they, they, do you know what I mean? Like all of these layers. And now I'm realizing, hey, emotions are just, they're just this like, barometer for where your energy is at and it's not my worth and um that helps me to be more vulnerable and the other thing that helps me to be more vulnerable and this is like the beautiful byproduct I never expected so when I started to show sketches and show feelings people that like I never realized had that capacity for that feeling so people that were like I don't know, like my friends that were just like the most macho figures, we would connect over something. And I'd be like, wow, you feel that way? I feel that way, interesting. And then I remember like, I never expected other people to to really confide in me. And, and then as soon as I got that, like one or two kind of like go aheads from people where they were like, hey, I feel like that too. I thought, oh my gosh, this is so worth it. It's, this is worth it because now I connect to you on a true level. Like now I connect to you on a way that you see me and I see you. And like, that is, again, it's just, I think the hard bits are the first bits. Like when you, when you make transitions into anything in life, the hard bits are when you like, you leave the harbor 
and you don't know, like you're midway in the sea and you can't see the destination and you just think you're alone. And then it's like, when you start to get to the destination, the people on the, the port, they see you and they start welcoming you and then you know you belong. But like the, the, mid, the mid transitions are really hard. Um, but for me now, like vulnerability is, is my, like, it's my gold, I think. I think that's what helps. Yeah. 2018, you have this, like you said, this out body experience where it starts to affect your body. Mm. And you go into 2019, which is kind of the brink of uh, us touching this COVID yeah. lockdown situation, and you find a way to wow, that's crazy, yeah. like to 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 make something out of what you used to experience, which was being locked in. How did yeah. that play out? It's just mad hearing you play out like that because in my head, since 2018, it feels like I've been in this for like seven years or so like a long time than just a little time because in that time I went to New York I went to a gallery went to Toronto I went to spaces that helped me to establish myself um but by the time 2019 came and 2020 I was at a point where I was getting recognized and I was kind of not recognized but in like I was getting commissions for big public events because I was doing street art and I was doing still am but I was doing like a lot of performance kind of skills paintings. So I would like go to like festivals and I was doing things like on that scale. So in 2020, I had like some big exhibitions lined up and big public facing things lined up that like, it was like, I was almost on the, like touching these kind of bigger scale things. And then just like that, like it kind of just that went, but because I was also, um, and not as stable in my career, like other things kind of, because when you're freelance, you're often the first person that can be just like axed from the, and you don't often have these safety measures in place of someone else looking out for you. So, you know, like, and also as an artist, often we live kind of nomadic lives. So I didn't have like a secure, really secure home and I didn't have like a, sec like a secure foundation. So in 2020, again, like a lot of things just shifted in a matter of weeks, like the home shifted, the job shifted, the relationship shifted, like a lot of things just shifted. Um, and I didn't expect it, but I did, I lent into my creativity. I remembered because it was at this really special point where things were, were leapfrogging upwards. And um, I'd stopped seeing like creativity as my joy. I'd stopped seeing it as like, this thing that I did to cope and to, to thrive and to connect. And it was like this thing to, to create and to express, but it was like, it was bigger and it was, I'd lost sight of that. And when, when I couldn't go to studio cause it was shut down and when projects are shut down and when I wasn't sure what to do, I remember just kind of reaching out to friends and family and being like, how are you feeling? And me doing the same. And then that's where I started the Strangers Yearbook project. And it was just really small scale sketches that I started reaching out to people on Instagram, just asking them how they're feeling. But the beauty in that was that I remembered in within one week, I remembered, wow, this actually like something so simple and humble as painting can make me really, really happy. That's crazy. And like, I remember just, you know, like just doing silly things like dancing or just seeing like, you know, just cooking or whatever, but those small moments were what gave me joy. And um, I really, that was a really good reality check to see like I'd, I, I forgot that like we create just for joy first and that should be the main reason and not for performance, which I think is a lot of what social media has kind of made us. But what did you learn about that? Because I mean, if you're, if you're talking about a time where we don't know when the world opens up again. Mm. Everyone's in lockdown, mm. but yet you're still managing to connect. Yeah. And that connection is also getting attention. Yeah. Well, you know that's like? uh, yeah. I mean, like also in context, right? Like it wasn't getting attention at the time. Mm -hmm. At the time it was just um, genuine at the time. And it still is, but at the time it was just like, I want to see how you're doing and what can I offer you? Oh, I, I can give you a gift. Cause I was literally thinking, what can I offer people? Like my friends and family, what can I give them to make them 
like I see you, I hear you, I feel you, I love you. And that was always the thing that I gave to people, even when I was kids, my, like it was cards, it was pictures, it was words. Um, so it was just something true that I could just give to people. And again, it was this thing of, they gave me their truth. They gave me their honest like selfie or their honest um, story that I didn't expect. And like, I think it's really interesting, like to go back to the introvert thing. Um, I was listening to this interview today by um, this like band that I've gotten into during lockdown. It's kind of like really lovely, but they were saying that um, the digital realm and lockdown has forced a lot of introverts to go into that digital realm. And, you know, like I wouldn't usually look to Instagram because I love to connect people one-on-one -on -one in person. And then lockdown happened and Instagram was like the easiest way to connect to people. And um, it kind of helped me in a way, like it helped me to see that you can build like genuine connections online and doesn't always have to be like flexing or it doesn't have to be a gimmick. It can just be um, like, how are you feeling? What are you up to? <laughs> And I think that like, it's really interesting that during lockdown, we've had more conversations and probably like a lot of people have really gone into conversation and a lot of people have gone into like reflection and that kind of thing. Yeah. Made reference to revolution. <laughs> yeah. And just studying people and leaders. Right, yeah. Do you feel like you, especially with, you know, we had the BLM movement, we've had the Pride movement, we've had a lot of movements that arrived through the lockdown. Do you feel like you are contributing to, 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 to or, or do you have a goal of impacting that narrative and, and, mm. and driving because you are a woman of colour? Sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, short answer, yes. With a caveat that my liberation is held up in everyone's liberation. Mm and that I'm a reflection of the whole. And so likewise, when it helped me to, when, when it helps me to not identify my emotions as who I am, it helps me to not identify Muslim, female, British, artist, liberal, like as who I am. And so whilst I might like represent a role and be like, okay, you're the role of an artist that shakes things up a bit, so maybe you could be a bit revolutionary. I know that at the core, I'm just um, whole and I'm connected to the whole of humanity. So if I can free myself of the systems of oppression I've built within myself, then we can all free ourselves. And so what I try intentionally to do is just do the work of working on myself to see where I've put shackles on what I'm capable of, the love I'm capable of receiving and giving and not falling into the same traps that lead to hate and love because they're the same size of the same coin. Like I feel like the opposite of hate is apathy, is laziness, is thinking you can't change. And so um, for me, like the only revolution that could come that could actually change things needs to come from a different consciousness because anything we create in the consciousness that we're in the mindset the culture that we're in is bound in like power over structures we've like we've been brought up in this system like this system where my power equals like a lack of your power and that's not healthy and that's not sustainable and that leads to like environmental crash and it leads to wars and it leads to famine and like when my power increasing my power can be the increase in your power and we can find power with each other then that's the kind of like world that I want to be in and that's what I'm creating and um I'm like trying to find ways that I can just love to see other people empowered and to see myself empowered and like you know how Einstein said that you can't create consciousness or you can't create the answer from the same consciousness that it was in. And it's like any answer that we have right now is just going to be held in the same questions and the same problems that have gotten us into this space of like separation and segregation. And so I'm really conscious that yes, like while you said you, I might represent like a Muslim cult, like 
of these labels, I know they're just labels and I know that my power doesn't represent the power of just that identity. It represents the power of everyone and that everyone else's power is in my power. Yeah. It's a really long answer, but no. when I just said yes, because it's like, yes, but <laughs> yeah. it's long and we haven't seen it before because when we have seen it before, I feel like, you know, like John Lennon, and like these people, like these incredible people, they had the answers, but they fell into a consciousness where the answers got distilled and the answers got distilled into a, like a basic level of understanding where the base element was fear. And then that just came out as like, again, we, we didn't we didn't really have a revolution. We just had a, a slight, slight honeymoon phase. And that's what I think might happen right now, to be honest with COVID. I, I feel like we could be in a point where we've got a great opportunity and people are really like, I wanna connect, I wanna be with people. I've like had time to reflect, I've had time to go into these things. And you always get this honeymoon phase. And I just really hope like, what are we gonna to do to remember this and not just go down into like polarity? Cause that's, that's a danger at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's really incredible. And it's clear and evident that you've constantly addressed and constantly constructing open ideas on, on yourself. Um, which I think is very refreshing because it's true. The the confinements of ourself can't really be broken until we actually observe ourselves and try to figure out how to unlock the shackles which you mentioned that we have mm. inside. So I think that's really powerful. Mm. How, how have you learned to deal with fear? <sighs> to try and use it as like a like a welcome friend of my of level of safety. So I feel like every emotion has its benefits. I'm trying to get to a point where I truly ex embody that like, there's no such thing as a good emotion or a bad emotion. So for example, anger doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that it could be like something that shows you that there's a boundary that's been crossed internally or externally or, um, jealousy it doesn't mean it's bad or good. It just means that, oh, maybe there's a part of you that wants to elevate into something else and you see something else that you feel like you could become. And fear, I'm starting to think maybe fear, it's not bad. It's just like a barometer of safety. And is there safety in this space for you? Um, so that's one part of like me learning to dance with fear. And then there's another part, which is me trying to be self-aware enough to know when it's fear out of discomfort. So like before any, like before the exhibitions I've had, before certain things, I've had this like crippling fear and like scaredness, but I've known it's the kind of scariness that people, I imagine when people talk about having a baby and they're like, I'm scared, but I'm excited. That fear, I've learned to try and distinguish that fear between the fear of like, Mm, maybe maybe that person doesn't have good intentions for me and that's a, not a safe space for me to be in or maybe like there's something that's afraid about that and trying to distinguish those two feelings of fear because I think they the one serves me and pushes me to go forward into my capabilities and the other one serves to protect me from uh from ill intentions um, does that answer your question? I don't know if that's like very, but that's all like, I mean, in terms of like actual, cause I feel like that's just words, right? Like, like what, what practices like can, have I done and what practices can others do to overcome fear? Baby steps, I think. I think um, don't try and tackle like the thing in one fell swoop. So, like we talked about being vulnerable, like vulnerable and sharing how you're feeling. You don't have to go and tell your parents the trauma that you've been through and everything in one fell swoop. You can just be vulnerable enough to um, to read an article that makes you feel a bit unsure. That's a vulnerable thing to challenge yourself. Or you can like 
um, be vulnerable enough to like a comment on someone's page that maybe your friends wouldn't think you'd you'd know you know like like every big fear has like baby steps and so like we can we can do little things that help us to like go towards a big fear I think and I'm sure like me I'll laugh at this because I'll probably be like I don't know like in a few years time be like I knew nothing I know nothing and the things that if I'm afraid of I don't even know I'm afraid of, you know, until I get challenged. So I think part of it is just like being open for the challenge as well. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually was watching a Michael Jackson documentary yesterday. Okay. He made a really good, well, there was a quote, I'm going to paraphrase it. Mm. But he says in the quote, um, I will live forever because my work will define me and continue my message. Yeah. What would you want your work to represent? Mm. So I thought about this. Beyond, beyond your existence. I think um, there's two distinguishing, like there's, there's two different things between the artist's life and the artist's work. And actually, I think what's more important to me is my life than my work. I think what's more important to me is like how people leave after they've like been with me and like the impact that like that interaction has. And then, and like the, how my days are and how, who I show up as in the world, because that's the true legacy because like your signature and that, that scent you leave with someone, you don't know the ripple effect of that. And I, I've had, times in my life where just one person has told me I'm special and that's changed the trajectory of my life. And so, yeah, like I'm doing all these things and making things, but I actually think like it's more important to show up as just a person that's present. And I know that's like probably like adverse to like a lot of what artists say, but I wish that more people would be more present with who they are and who they show up as. Um, because I think that like that's how you change things really um, and then it will just inevitably trickle down like when you're joyous the things that you create will be joyous rather than um, yeah but yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think and I can and that's, that's a very interesting uh, perspective especially from an artist because yeah. A lot of the time, artists prefer to be their their, their work to be a front facing element mm. of the energy exchange, whereas you're actually valuing your exchange, which I think is incredible. What would you tell the eighteen year old self that you now know today? Mm. <laughs> when I was eighteen, um, that it's brave to ask for help really brave to ask for help I was so scared and still am scared sometimes to ask for help and that's like a brave thing to do um and then uh, I mean a part, I would probably say you're special it's so cliche but I really think that like if everyone not just me, like if every single person felt they were seen and heard and they were special, um, we'd have a lot more like geniuses in the world and a lot more people that were creating things and a lot more time. And I think just to be like, you're special, don't berate yourself so much, don't dig on yourself so much, you don't need to be perfect, you don't need to be like... You don't need to have it all together. Like whatever essence you have in you is special and hold that. I think like um, it's like a really nice thing to do for someone to like, to, to for someone to feel special. It's like a, it's a good feeling to have. Um, and the other thing, which I try and do is like, just to keep a sense of wonder in the world. Um, without being naive, without being like, you know, like head in the sand, but just to like try and be optimistic 
and like see the sense of wonder and like I would say like hold on to that. Yeah. So last question. Yes. Who is Karima Hassan? <laughs> Uh, evolving I'm just evolving like day by day honestly I feel like um, the person I am right now is so different to the person I was just a month ago like when you said 2018 like that blew my mind because I feel like that is just such a hard like that person was so far away and the person that like I grew up as is so far away that um yeah, like I just try and show up every day as a, a brand new s slate. So right now in this moment, who am I? Uh, I'm at peace. That's that's just me. I'm at peace. Yeah. Thank you so much for sitting with us today. Thank you. And I think, you know, just what you're doing, what you're sharing, what you're expressing is touching people. And I think that's the thing with inspiration. Um, there's so many levels to it. You know, you could be inspiring someone just by sharing your work by doing a video mm. by talking so i feel like you're constantly touching people in ways that you may not even get the feedback on mm. so one like real like pragmatic thing that i think um i would tell my 18 year old self i'm realizing now as you're saying is like you can make a living off of this it's so so pragmatic but so mm. i i wish i knew that if i knew i can make a living off the thing that i love what like I would I wouldn't have gone around like all the different ways to do it I would have just gone straight into that um so that's yeah I, I think I like a lot of people deserve to know that they can make a living off the thing that they love uh, it's, it's interesting for your passion. yeah thank you very much bringing in thank you